culture. Come on, man. That was out of this world, man. I don't even think that they were copying Europeans. Ballet was literally in ancient Kemet and around different various cultures in, in ancient Africa from day dot. Brother, Kabar, I don't want to take up any more of your time. All I want to say, brother, we love you. We love you. We love you, brother. And brothers and sisters, get your pens and papers ready because we're about to enter a, um, a master class from our king and our soldier, Professor Kabar. Brother, I leave it to you, my king. Oh, wow. My brother, what a presentation from what I've seen. And uh, so much of it um, comes together. And it's so important that we realize it. I congratulate you, brother, on what a, a phenomenal presentation. To put those images in front of us, uh, Hollywood, and then the ballet, you know, and then the idea of Africanizing it. Because that's what I meant when I said that. Because you see, the very first drama that ever existed, the, the very first play that was performed on our planet that we have a recorded message of is called the Asarian drama. Every, every type of movie that is played with the antagonist and the protagonist and the uh, challenge of the film, every film that you watch has a particular theme. It has a method to getting to it. It's telling a story. And that story was first told on Shabaka Stone. The last part of the Shabaka Stone tells of the Asarian drama. And it's important for us to understand that psychologically what has happened to us as a people, and when you looked at the codes that had been laid out in Hollywood, um, the idea of uh, a black kiss to show that human beings who had attraction to each other, who expressed themselves. But what they don't show you is that there are pictures of Akhenaten and his family kissing, carved on the walls. That's, that's just there. Uh, in my presentations that I've done on the 18th dynasty of Kemet, there are pictures of them showing themselves kissing. So Black folk have been kissing themselves before Europeans and Asians existed. So when you Africanize something, what you do is you take whatever it is and you look at it through your own cultural common sense. And what has happened as you showed that, that piece in Roots where people were watching and they were taking it in, unable to express their truest feelings, watching somebody, a young man, because that's what Kunta was at the time. He was a young man getting beat. The idea of buck breaking, to do that in front of everybody, to make everybody watch what will happen to you if you dare step out of line. And that is what has happened each time. Bob Marley has his song. He says, how long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's just a part of it. We have to fulfill the book. But what Bob Marley was actually saying, look, there's example there. You know that this is us. This is who we are. This is what we have done. And the key is that in our own writing, in our own images, we have this. And you see, this is what's happening now. And that's why the code was put out there. It was to tell you, don't let Black people be seen, not just for you to see them that way, but for them to see them that way. Because when you show Black love, you show the potential of what you can do. And you're right, Brother Muhammad. One of the things that we, particularly as black men, have to learn how to do is to say, I love you and mean it. But the first person we have to say, I love you to is, is us. Say that again, say that again, brother. Let me tell you, okay, here's a story. Professor John Henry Clark, I was 12 and a half when I first met him. 
some brothers and sisters brought us up to Harlem. These would be the same people that would bring me up uh, to uh, Black Panther meetings. They were the same ones that would bring me to um, the, um, the temple, the Nation of Islam um, on 116th Street, on the mosque. These were the same older brothers and sisters that used to teach us and talk to us about our culture. Well, one day in the summer, it was the end of June, they brought us up to um, Harlem and we were listening to a gentleman speak. He was about 51 at this time. I was 12 and a half. And at the end, they brought us all up to him. They introduced us and it, we're talking about Professor John Henry Clark. Yes. And when I was introduced to Professor John Henry Clark, my name at that time was Booker T. Coleman. And they introduced me as Booker T. He said, oh, Booker T, you're going to be a great teacher one day. And we laughed. You know, I'm 12 and a half. I'm not necessarily thinking about being a teacher. I, I, I'd rather go into space, to tell you the truth. I, I, I was fascinated with uh, cosmology. But he gave me a homework assignment. He gave us all, because there was about five of us that were very young. And um, he gave us a homework assignment. And he said, I want you to go home and I want you to go into your bathroom and look in the mirror. And I want you to tell the person that you're looking at, I love you. He said, because if you can't do that, there's nothing anyone else can do for you. And you know, family to this day, <laughs> I still throw myself kisses when I'm leaving the house to tell me I love me. I love everything about me. Each of us should love everything about whoever we are. The creator doesn't make mistakes. When you were born, he gave you a particular nose and lips and complexion and hair texture because the creator said, that's what I wanna look like. The creator did not put anything on you that he said, well, they'll fix it later. And we, as a people, have been taught that everything about us is unacceptable. Everything about us is derogatory. Everything about us is bad. And we have learned this over time because they know that if ever you should find out who you really are, you're going to Simone Biles all this. You know Simone Biles, the young gymnast who is doing phenomenal work in gymnastics, winning all sorts of awards. They told her she can't do something. They don't want her to perform a particular routine. Well, why not? And they say, because we can't. In other words, what they're telling you is that you can't be great because they'll never catch up to you. They'll never be able to do what you're doing. So therefore you can't do it. You can't set the bar up too high for them. And the same thing that we do in sports and the same thing that we do in entertainment, we can do in the classroom, we can do in education. And that's what I've dedicated my life to, particularly with our young people, to assist them in understanding that there is nothing you can't do. All you have to do is put your mind to it. And the story of cosmology tells us this. The book that I, I wrote two years ago, Spirituality Before Religions, outlines a particular way to look at what it is that we're doing and who it is that we are and to go deep inside of ourselves to understand exactly who we are as a people. Spirituality before religions opens up new ways of us looking at ourselves in the world that we're living in to allow us to rise above all things, Africanize it, 
Africanize it. And my third book, which I've just sent to be formatted now, it is in the process of being formatted. Shabaka Stone. Shabaka Stone is a phenomenal text. It, I was first introduced to it in 1975 by Dr. George G.M. James. You need to have that book in your library because it's the first time I ever was introduced to something known as the Memphite theology. And the Memphite theology opened up a whole new way of looking at the cosmos. And that's what Shabaka Stone does. This is who we are as a people, the Shabaka Stone. And by the way, to my family that's in UK, the Shabaka Stone is in the British Museum. It's number 498. When you walk in, you just walk up. This is when I went to UK in 2009. I was doing um, uh, some work and you know they invited me to do a tour of the British Museum. And so when I was there, we stopped outside the uh, Shabaka Stone. This is our family in UK. And there were folk that told me, I've been in this museum before, but I never knew the importance of the Shabaka Stone because no one has ever really explained exactly what this stone represents. It changes the entire dynamic of how scientists look at the world. In fact, there are things that are carved on this stone that even today's science cannot deal with because they don't have the intellectual enzymes to digest the majesty of the African intellect. Just like you saw that sister who was doing ballet, okay? That's beyond ballet. Ballet has taken an African art and brought it down because the inability to interpret the spiritual analysis of the relationship of music, the sound, phonons, and what it does to the body and what it makes the body do because when you watch that system go through her movements, she was in harmony. She was Ma'ati in harmony with the air around her. She had joined nature. See, this is what happens when you Africanize things. You know, Michael Jackson had a piece where they were talking to him about why he gyrates his body. They never asked Elvis that question, but they asked Michael Jackson, why do you gyrate your body? Because Elvis was really copying another performer by the name of Jackie Wilson. If, if, if you study Jackie Wilson, and Jackie Wilson was a brother that we used to see him on the Ed Sullivan show. He became very popular in the 50s and 60s. In fact, when Motown music was first developing, he was the first artist on Motown. He had songs like Baby Workout, you know? And what he would do is, when you see Elvis Presley gyrating and moving his body, his hips and all that, if you watch Jackie Wilson perform, who was around before Elvis, you'll see where Elvis got his acting and his dancing from. But Michael Jackson, when they said to him, why do you move your body like that? He said, you got to blame it on the rhythm. You got to blame it on the rhythm. And basically what that means is that when the music plays, the African body goes into a relationship with the sounds of that music. And we cannot help ourselves. We cannot control that because that is nature. That is the nature in us meeting the nature of light, heat, and sound energy. And we perform a certain way. When you look at jazz music, the improvisation, you get a sense that the same thing is going on because the jazz artists never played the same song the same way. They always would add something or take something away or do something different every time they performed. And so we have to Africanize who we are as a people. 
and this is why with my book, Spirituality Before Religions, people have contacted me. They say, well, what religion are you? I don't have a religion. I'm an African. I'm all of them. I, I, I don't know what to tell you I am because I know that my mindset, I know that the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, the Torah, I know where they're found in Africa. When you look at the New Testament, the foundations of what we today call Christianity. I can show you that scripture carved on the walls of the pyramid text of an African Pharaoh named Unas. When I look at the surahs of the Quran, I can tell you and show you where they came from in Africa. I can do the same thing with Rosicrucian, Zoroastri, Confucius, Zen. I can show it to you even in atheism and in agnostic. I can show you the African, where it came from. So we have to embrace it all, but we have to Africanize it and we have to own it. And so when we see these movies, that they have come to take from us our legacy. That's why we have to create our own. We had a brother named Oscar Michaud back in the day. He was a, a movie producer and he produced some of the finest movies in the United States. The black man, Oscar Michaud, M-I-C-H, a-E-U-X, I think is how you spell his name. Something like that. Oscar Michaud. When you look at someone like Paul Robeson, a giant of a man, you, you have to know him. You have to know what he's done. You have to know what he's achieved. He was the first African-American to ever have his name on the top left hand of the advertisement for the movie, because that's the, the person that's in the top left, who, whoever's name is in the top left, that's the top actor in the movie. He had his name up there, Paul Robeson. When you look at Bill Bojangle Robinson, Step and Fetch It, all of them led the way for who we are today. And we all have to understand and realize what it is that we have to do. That's the man, the tall tree in the forest. Paul Robeson, he was a lawyer. He was an actor. He was a singer. He was an activist. He spoke multiple languages, sang in multiple languages. This is Paul Robeson. Freedom fighter above. Baba, I'm loving, Baba. I'm not, you know, I'm just being moved by you, Baba. I know when I first found out about Paul Robeson and I, was, and I watched one of his movies and read I literally cried, Baba. I'll say to you that no shame, um, Baba, um, Professor Kabar. I literally cried. I cried, Baba. Sorry. No, no. And you see, the other thing, brother, is what we're doing today. Please feel free um, uh, to be able to have an interactive conversation. Uh, because we're at a point now where information sharing, lecturing, if you want to call it that, has its place. But as a community, we all must take ownership of our, ourselves and what we're doing. So I want this to be interactive because I, because I want us to be able to engage because this is an African tradition. See, the, the European model, the Asian model of, of, of school or this type of presentation is that I come and I lecture. But African folk interact with each other. That, that's what I mean when I say Africanized. We, we interact with each other. We have something to say to each other. We are impacted by what we said. Like you said, I'm impacted by what you say. You responded to it. That's the African tradition. It's an interaction. It's not that I'm talking and you're listening. It's that we are having a communion, a common union. 
so that we can get this conversation going and get it electrified. And if there's people that would like to ask questions or deal with issues, see, for me, this is how I operate because I, I've been around children for so long. This is how children operate. And this is why I believe that my time in the classroom was successful because I didn't sit and pontificate with the children. I would go in there because education comes from the word educe. Bring out. To draw out. And so what I attempt to do is I try to draw out of the listener his or her experiences. And in so doing, then they react to me. And then and so I react to them. And pretty soon there is a common union or a communion. So brothers and sisters, you heard what our professor stated. If there are any questions, use the Q&A box. Or if you'd like to um, make a statement, put your hand up, raise your hand. I'm going to put down the hands. I can see quite a few hands in the, um, um, in the chat room already. I'm going to lower all the hands. And then I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if there's something you'd like to ask or state to our dear brother. He's given us the time. And remember, brothers and sisters, that, you know, never take anything for granted. We are here together right now, not because of an accident, not because of vanity. There's a reason why we are on this platform all together. And we've got this fantastic teacher and guide in front of us. Let's use it. So don't be um, afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. If it's moved within you to ask a question or to clarify or to back up what our brothers have stated. Yes, sir. It, it is a powerful thing to understand what our ancestors actually did and what they achieved. But it is also very important for us to understand why what is happening to us is happening to us. And there is a reason, and I can understand. My mother always said, always think like those who would wish to oppress you. Because the moment you start thinking like those who wish to oppress you is the day that you can start to respond to what's happening to you. Because as long as you think and react the way you think and react, you are not gonna be able to solve your issue. You gotta think like those who would wish to oppress you or to do you harm. Walk in that person's shoes to understand what's going on. And so when I do that, I come to realize something. If I were them under the conditions that they are under, I, I would do the same thing. If I thought like them and acted like them, if I knew my time was up, if I knew that everything that I had done to a people didn't work, and that with all of the pain and other things I put them through, they are still able to achieve, I would realize that I have a problem. They have a problem. Their time is up. And that is why here in the United States, you see them conducting themselves the way they're conducting themselves. Um, you know, but brother, please. sir, brother, sir, um, just one quick question, please, brother, sir. And that is from sister Rosita, Rosita, who's asked how now, why and how is the Shabaka stone in the UK? Okay. And, 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 before you, and before you answer that, King, sorry, my King, before you answer that, Brother Leonard, is there a, is Brother Leonard? Brother greetings, there. greetings. Greetings, Hotel family. Hotel. Greetings, Brother Andrew. Hotel, greetings. Professor Hotel. Kaba. Hotel, Brother Leonard. Yes, sir. Greetings. Did you have a question or a statement, my big brother? Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I want to take this opportunity, uh, Brother Kaba, to thank you for your phenomenal work. But my question is in relation to the uh, Shabaka stone, because I, I know you tell a phenomenal story about this stone, but I want you to tell the family about, you know, the, the time difference between when the Memphite theology was originally written uh. bit, and to, uh, to, <laughs> to when uh, um, Pharaoh Shabaka found it, Worm eaten and the time difference between when it was originally written and now, you know, yes. that's a fact. Originally written to when Shabaka, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, and, brother, and, sir, can you combine those two answers together, sir? How and why is the Shabaka stone in the UK Museum? And obviously, Baba Leonard. So I'll leave you, my king. Absolutely. And, and please keep good questions like this coming. Brother Leonard, your question is something that is profound. And 
when we look at the phenomenal idea of the Shabaka stone, we come to realize something. Shabaka was a pharaoh, a Neset Biti of what we call the Napatan dynasty. I, I, I talk about there's a section in spirituality before religions where I'm focusing directly on this. Shabaka was a, a Neset Biti, a pharaoh. I'm, I'm going to give you a date, give or take. These dates will probably change. But for now, science and, and African scholars such as Sheikh Anta Diop and Asa Hilliard and Dr. John Henry Clark all agree that it would have been around 710 years before the common era or give or take for us 2,700 years ago, give or take. 710 BC, give or take. That is when Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote a more ancient document called the Memphite text. Now, I've given you three different variables to work on. The Memphite text when it was first written, Pharaoh Shabaka when he wrote it, and then today, March 2nd, 2021. Let's look at those three dates. We don't know when the Memphite theology was written because it was so old. When Pharaoh Shabaka came upon the document, it had been worm-eaten. The Memphite text was either written on papyri paper or it was written or, or carved on leather. When, when we're not quite sure which. But what we know by the first two lines, brother, can you show the Shabaka stone where you can see the stone itself? Can you show that brother Muhammad? Yes, sir. Give me one second, sir. Because there are four different sections to the Shabaka stone. Okay, now, the, the top, the, the, the top two lines, can, can, uh, can you go back to that other one that shows the Shabaka stone? Yeah, there it is right there, okay? You see the top two lines up here. Those are horizontal. Those two lines tell the historical journey of how Shabaka came upon the document. Those two lines at the top, the horizontal lines, in Medu Neter, they tell the story of how Pharaoh Shabaka came upon the document. And this is where he says that he came upon it because it was worm eaten and it could not be read from beginning to end. So he asked his scientists to rewrite this theory, this theology on stone for it to remain. You know how we have the uh, proverb, we say, oh, that's written in stone. Yes. Well, that comes from the concept of our ancestors who wrote everything in stone for us. So that we, they knew that a day would come when somebody was going to come and try to destroy their legacy and steal it. So they had it in stone so that when we would come upon it, we would know it for what it was. Because the time that Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote it and the time that it was written, okay? From when Shabaka wrote it, rewrote it, and when it was originally voted and wrote and on the uh, papyrus or on the uh, leather. Now take when Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote it and today about 2,700 years. When Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote it, his ancestors that he was talking about, there was more of a time distance between when it was written and when he rewrote it than when Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote it and today. The Memphite text was a very old document. It was a document that was probably five to six, maybe 7,000 years old. 
remember I told you 710 BCE, 710, basically give or take, if we're in 2021 and you're looking at 710, you know, you're, you're looking basically at a little over 2,700 years ago, 2,000 and then 700, give or take 2,700 years. You can add the 10 and the 21, you get 31. You can say 2,731 years ago if you wanna be exact with the dates I gave you. But that time is not as long as when Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote it and when it was originally vote, uh, a wrote. So what I'm saying to you is that when Pharaoh Shabaka rewrote the Memphite theology, he was speaking to his ancestors further away from him than Pharaoh Shabaka is from us today. That's how old this document is. I'm That's sorry, how... Professor. Is it possible just to cut in just here? I've had a question about um, what is actually written on the Shabaka stone and, uh, you know, what is actually, what is it all about? So there's lots okay. of people kind of questioning what, what that particular artifact is trying to show. What information is it sharing? No doubt. My sister uh, Bennett, absolutely. There are three <laughs> philosophies. There are three philosophies written on a Shabaka stone, which are the vertical lines. The vertical lines you read from top to bottom. You go to each top to the bottom, top to the bottom, top to the bottom. There are three philosophies in the Shabaka stone. The first philosophy is called the primate of the essences. The primate of the essences is the story of the original Trinity. Teach us. It is the Nun, the Pata, and the Atum. Now, of course, you hear the word Atum, and all of a sudden now, you realize, wait a minute now, I've heard that word before. Oh yeah, Adam. That's where the word Adam came from, A-T-O-M. But in Christianity, that's where the name of Adam came from. Because in the story, our ancestors did something that was radically different from any thought previous to that. You know what we say? We say, wow, uh, time, time. We, 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 we all deal with time. But the thing is, what happens when you ask yourself, what existed before time existed? What existed before existence existed? What existed before the beginning began? That put our ancestors in a totally different philosophical, psychological framework. But they gave this existence before existence a name. They called it the Nun, N-U-N. -N. And it was in the Nun where everything lived in potential, in potential energy. They said that at some appointed time, some anointed time, an occurrence occurred. Something happened for the first time. And they called it Kepra Septepi. K H E P E R. I'm sorry, fam, I got a spell for you. Yes, please. Please. Be be because I think it's very important to spell words, not just say them out like that and people go along with it. I need to spell it for you, for you to visualize it. If you want to take the notes, because Brother Muhammad already said, take your pencils out, be ready to take notes, because we're in school today. Kepra Septepi, K-H-E-P-E-R-A, first word, Sep, S-E-P, Sep, Tepi, T-E-P-Y. Kepra Septepi, what means the coming into being for the first time. That essence they called Pata, P 
P-T-A-H. Ptah was like a hill that came up out of the mountain, uh, out of the waters of Nun. That's the second part of the Trinity. The third part of the Trinity was Atum, A-T-U-M. Atum came up out of the waters of Nun through the energy of Ptah, sat atop Ptah, and called everything and all in the universe into order. So look at what you have. Now, in the United States of America, you could turn a dollar bill around and look on the back, and I just gave you the primate of the essences because on the back of a United States dollar bill, you have the pyramid with the capstone detached from it. And inside you have the eye, and that is the atom. And the entire concept of what they're saying is that in the very beginning of the unit, now here's the science of it. This is what we teach in science class. What they're saying now is that in the very beginning, before all things existed, before anything existed, everything was in the waters of Nun. Now in science, we know that to be true because everything is hydrogen. There's only one atom, really. There's only one element that exists in the periodic table of elements, and that's hydrogen. Because every other, I'm, they, they say there's 109, but there's really 92 natural. Everything after 92 has been created in a, in a laboratory. But what you're dealing with is that everything that you do, if you take two hydrogen atoms, you have helium. If you take three hydrogen atoms, you have uh, lithium. If you take six hydrogen atoms, you have carbon. Because carbon is number six on the periodic table of elements. This is why I tell our family that we have to study because this isn't European information. This is African information that was taught to Europeans and they're still getting it wrong. They're still getting it wrong. But the idea of pata is the conversion. You all right, Sister Bennett? You, <laughs> we, we, we working together on this? Yeah, I'm hearing you. I've so far, you. so I'm good. just adding everything that you've said into the chat for people. So yeah, I'm hearing you. It, it, it's a very powerful concept, my Sister Bennett. This is what we're facing as a people right now. And the idea is that pata represents the conversion of energy. It represents converting potential energy or energy at rest into kinetic energy or energy in motion. And it is this conversion of energy within the waters of the universe that brings forward creative intelligence. And that is who Atum is. Atum is creative intelligence. Atum, and that is why Atum calls everything into being. This is why go into the Old Testament. What is Adam's job? Adam, Adam as in Adam and Eve. There is Pata. Also, by the way, you know, in the United States, they have in the movies, they give people Oscars. Well, this is where the statue came from. Look at the Oscar, the statue that they give the actors and actresses that win and look at this picture, but now let's look at the word Oscar, take the C out of Oscar, and what do you have? You have a SAR. O-S-C-A-R, take the C out of Oscar, and you have a SAR. Pata is another representation of a SAR. This is all us. They stole our legacy, <laughs> our legacy, and they put their name on it. That's why Dr. George G.M. James titled his book, Stolen Legacy. And we don't even realize that we are admiring them for admiring us. So that's the first philosophy, the primate of the essences, Nun, Atum. Nun is the waters. Pata is the conversion of energy from potential to kinetic. 
and atum is the creative intelligence that calls everything into being. But in science, what is it that he's actually calling into being? He's calling into being philosophy number two, which is the essences of pre-existing order and arrangement. See, this is why I say about our people. In science, they call this the Ogdod, which is the gods of chaos. But in African philosophy, there's no such thing as chaos. You don't have chaos. What is chaos to Europeans is pre-existing order and arrangement. And so the idea of pre-existing order and arrangement, that's us. We think they say we're in chaos as a people. We're not in chaos. Black folk ain't in chaos. We're in pre-existing order and arrangement. We're waiting for somebody to come along and put us into order and arrangement. This is why people like the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. This is why, because all of these individuals represent the concept of taking things that are in pre-existing order and putting them in order and arrangement. Okay. Let's now look at philosophy number two. I'm gonna pause you just there, sir, please. I have somebody who has actually come online who wants to ask you a question direct. But don't, don't forget okay. where you are, sir. Don't forget you are, philosophy okay. number two. I'm gonna stick two. a pin there. I'll stick a pin there. We're gonna be all over you today, sir. Okay, there we go. Baba Abduli. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Greetings, my brother. Um, gratitude and appreciation to the family. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, almost 15 years ago, I was in similar chair, learning from you, brother, then called Dr. Booker T with um, our legend, um, the Sorry. Take your time, brother. Take your time, brother. Sir Henry John Clark. Um, yeah. I'm from the Gambia, West Africa, born in Islamic religion. Didn't really sit well with anything I was learning, got into Sufism, transcended into the journey. And some 15 years ago, I took these notes that you're teaching again from mm. you. Wow. Beautiful, okay. Brother Abduli. This is, this is my Savatha stone. Wow. It's in the leather folder. Today I'm taking notes again from a different book. But this lesson I have been blessed with and transcended and helped a lot of souls around the world. And I would love to continue to because this is a solidification of, if you remember, you haven't dwell expanded on the noon, which, yes. which is the nothingness. Yes. And you did expand at that time on Nunet, Fahet, Kut, Kuket, yes. and Amen and Amanet. Mm. In the Pata stage of our existence where you just touch on to transcend into a tomb, is fundamentally scientifically realistic that we can bring it home yes. to exactly how we co-create as being. And so to me, I would like you to expand on that Sabaka stone, not to be a mystery of a, an object sitting somewhere, yes. but a story that fits in our eternity, our divine being, and that we can excel to be seen within and without. Yes. So again, so much to say, but there's little to say because when the teach when the student is ready, the master appears. The first that time is. I connect with you, Papa J, and I appreciate you. I give thanks to the brother that invited me to this. And I will always be in tune and connected. 
can, 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 can I just say this? Our... And we send our light to the brother that's just passed to the other side as well. Bonnie Whaler, we always have been and will always be with the ancestor. Peace and Brother blessings. Ab Peace and Brother blessings. Abdullah, Brother Abdullah, Brother, you you know, before Brother Kabar comes in, Professor Kabar, sorry, comes in. Brother, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tonight, Brother. You. Please, thank brothers and sisters, you. in the chat room, show some love. This is our brother in the thank Gambia. You. Thank you. Then thank that you. He was thank making you. his thank notes you. of thank our you. teacher Please. tonight Please. 15 Please. years ago. Please. Brother, Please. I yeah. love your spirit. Thank I you. love the way you articulated thank yourself, you. brother. Thank and you. tonight, this show is for you, brother. We thank He's you. He's a great teacher. He's a great teacher. I've great learned teacher. a lot from him. We'll continue to learn the manifestation, the biophysics, the chemistry. Come on, King. It's all connected with this, brother. So listen, listen good, take notes, and learn, and you will grow. We bow Give to you, brother. Brother Abdullah, you've got a family over here, King. Give thank thanks. you so much, soldier. Peace. Peace. Yes, peace, peace, my brother. Peace brother Professor Kabar, please come in. Thanks. Come in, sir. Well, the brother opened up by saying that he's overwhelmed, and I've got to open up by saying I'm overwhelmed. That the brother would uh, cite his his uh, notes from 15 years ago. 15 years, Professor. And the brother took notes. You see, this is what we have to do, family. We have to study. We have to study like our ancestors did. And I know that I hear and I've heard things and I've told our children when I was their teacher, when we have a young person who is very intelligent and study hard and always ask questions, it appears that they, they, they relate him to acting or thinking white when they're intelligent. I'm saying, no, you are thinking black because <laughs> you are the essence of intelligence. Before any of they, them existed, you were intelligent. You were in classrooms. You were writing. You taught the world how to read, how to write. You taught the world how to think properly. And there's something I'd like to say that brother had mentioned. He said that he was born into the faith system of Islam. And he said that there were things that didn't quite get answered and that he went to Sufism. But I wanted to just talk about Sufism for those that might not know what that is. Sufism is the Africanization by Indo-Europeans of an African thought process that came out of the mountains of Ethiopia. This is the same story coming out of Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia. This is where Islam came from. Islam happened to come through. And where did it come through? It came through Yemen. And it came up through because that's the first place where humans crossed over into the land we today call Saudi Arabia. And so we, we know that every major religion that touched upon the African philosophy, Sufism is to Islam, what the Kabbalah is to Hebrewism. The Kabbalah is the Africanization of Hebrewism. Sufism is the Africanization of Islam because it was all African from the beginning. And Christianity is the Amen priesthood. This is ours. And wherever you see an African celebrating a major religion, so-called it came from Indo-Europeans, it's different from the way Indo-Europeans celebrate it. If, if you go into a Black Christian Roman Catholic church, it's very different from when you go to a regular Roman Catholic church. When you look at the nation of Islam, it is very different from the Islam that you see in other parts of the world. And so it becomes important that we, what, what brother is explaining is there and it's deep. And what the brother talked about was, and I'm glad my sister Bennett, I think you were the one that came in and said the brother had something to say. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did that because that's the entrance into the second philosophy because the essences of pre-existing order and arrangement atum called into being four pairs. Come on, the Enneag, teach King. Okay. Teach. 
He called in Nun Nunet. Nun represents matter. Nunet represents space. Space. Wherever you see a T, that's the feminine. Because here's another thing, family. I can't get my head around an only male God. Okay. Brother, say that again. Please I say can't that again. That. Say that I again. Say, I, yeah, I, I'm going to say it again, but my head can't handle Teach. the idea that people actually believe that everything could come into being by a man. To have a God, you must have a goddess. If you don't have a goddess, you ain't got a God. That's science. Science. Electricity creates magnetism. Magnetism creates electricity. They live for each other. Electricity is the male energy. Magnetism is the female energy. Oh, brother, you're giving it to us tonight. Come on. In the atom, you have the nucleus of the atom and you have a neutron and a proton in the nucleus. The neutron is what keeps everything shaped, but it is the proton that is the feminine energy, the magnetism that draws. And then around the atom, you have the electron. The electron is the male energy. If you didn't have an electron, you wouldn't have a proton. If you didn't have a proton, you wouldn't have an electron. If you didn't have a proton and an electron, there would be no need for a neutron to keep everything harmony. Well, well, sit, doctors, doctors, stop, stop, please. Brothers and sisters, are you lit? Look, look, if you're feeling the brother, put smelly. You got to. If it, the brother is smelling the house up tonight. The <laughs> house stinks with science, love, energy, and truth. Let the brother know. But your ones, but your smelly five, but it stinks. Doctor, you're st professor, you're stinking up the UK tonight, Redrin. We gotta Jeez, do this. Carry on, brother. Carry on. Carry on. We gotta do this. Carry on, soldier. Carry on. But because we're talking science. Everybody gets caught up in the metaphor. You see, they take things very literally. They took this story and they took atom and they made atom Adam. They made it a man of European descent because they couldn't handle the metaphor. They, they didn't understand. They being those who stole our legacy, the Greeks and the Romans. Not only that, but they misdefined Adam because they said that Adam meant uh, could not uh, was indivisible, could not be divided. But we've already divided the proton, neutron, and electron. We already know that they've been divided up into smaller entities. They're not the smallest thing, but they're the smallest thing that we can detect, that we can actually measure our science by. So we already know that you know you have gluons, you have leptons that even are smaller than the three aspects of the atom. They didn't know what they're talking about. They still don't know what they're talking about. And that's why we've got to study this ourselves and come to a scientific conclusion about who we are as a people and how this applies to us. Okay, you have Nun Nunet, which is Nun is male, represents matter. Nunet is female, she represents space. You have ha, which is male, and ha uh, represents infinity, things that could not end. Then you have ha het, which represents finity, things that could be bounded, things that have a limit. Then you have kuk, and kuk represents the darkness. Kuket, the female, she represents the light. Amen, A-M-E-N. And for those of you who go to church and the ministers say, can I get an amen? Now you know where amen comes from. Amen means the hidden fertile waters. And then you have amenet, which is the revealed things that you can see. But look at these eight essences, matter, space, infinity, finity, darkness, light, the hidden and the revealed. Those eight are the characteristics and definition of what brings all things into order and arrangement. 
everything is made up of matter or space. All things either have no limits at all or they have limits. All things are dark or they are light. And then all things are hidden or they're revealed. So what the second philosophy is telling us is that before you can have order and arrangement, when things are in pre-existing order and arrangement, they stay within the waters of Nun awaiting the call to bring things into being. And so this second philosophy is setting up the stage for the third philosophy. Remember the first one, Nun, and you have Pata and Atum. That's the first philosophy. The second philosophy, Atum, calls into being Nun, Nunet, Ha, Ha, Het, Ka, Ka, Ket, Amun, and Amunet, which means that what's really happening is that the science is identifying the eight characteristics of order and arrangement. And then the third philosophy comes. And the third philosophy now, Atum, is now going to transform himself. She is going to become Atum Kepra, which is going to call in to being the essences of order and arrangement. And this is what created the superclusters, the clusters, the galaxies, the stars, the planets. That's what's going to order and arrange all things. Sir, I'm going to stop you there one more time, please. No, you can stop me every time. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's I'm all right. Don't apologize, my sister. This uh, is what we're doing here. I, I, I like this. I like this. Cool. Um, I've had a lot of questions come through um, and I'm glad that you've touched on how the feminine sort of comes in and matches with, with the masculine, I suppose. I, what some of the questions that there are now is why we think that this feminine is being hidden or um, why do they try and fight women, I suppose, in these things? Why is that particular part of the, of the equation always sort of missed out? Why do you think that might be? Well, coming from a sociological perspective, more than anything else, so that, so that we could be clear, is that black, black men, for the most part, back in when, when, when we were among, we didn't act like that. We knew that there was a place for women. We honored and understood the role that women played in the cosmic universe. But Indo-Europeans have been at war with everything for as long as they've ever known. And it's just something that we've experienced and that this society does. They don't give credit to anybody but themselves and even they fight amongst them, themselves for credit. They have a serious problem because they know not their mother. How could you grow, come from the womb of a woman and grow to curse her, to deny her her rights. Because you know, no, 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 no matter what, when you deny any woman something, you deny all women, your mother, your grandmother, your aunt and everybody else. If you don't respect women, you don't respect your mother. You don't respect your grandmother. You don't respect the womb from whence you came. So if you don't respect the womb from whence you came, how could you possibly respect yourself? And if you don't respect, respect yourself, how can you respect somebody else? Look at how they act. Don't believe what I'm saying. The evidence is how they conduct themselves. Look at how they conducted themselves on January 6th in the Capitol building of the United States of America. Look at how they acted. And then they get upset when Elijah Muhammad calls them devils and there you got that man with them horns up on his head. And then you get upset because Elijah Muhammad says that they act like devils, yet you put the devil's horns up on side your head. And you conduct yourself that way. There are things that we have to start looking at, and this is just not in the United States of America. It's happening there in the UK. It's happening in other parts of Europe. 
It's even happening amongst Europeans in Africa. They have a lack of respect. And I think that lack of respect is that they fear that they would have to submit to the power of the woman. Submission is not a bad thing if done properly. There are certain things that sisters do well. There's nothing that a, a, a man does that a sister cannot do. There are differences and Africans understood the differences. They celebrated the differences, but they did not make their qualities better than someone else's qualities. The only time you do that is when you are fearful that you don't have what it takes. Because if you're superior, you don't have to tell people you're superior. You just do what you do and it's superior. It's only when you don't believe you're superior that you got to tell other people that you're superior. Because if you say it enough, maybe you'll believe it. And so that's one of the great challenges that we have. Brothers, we have to sit by our sister's side. It's not about putting a sister up on a pedestal. It's not about making her someone that she's not. It's about recognizing the beauty that she is. Teach. We don't want the sister up on the pedestal. We don't want her behind us, beside us, together, in ma'at, in balance. We make things happen. Our women are to be with us. And what they feel, what they think matters to the success of anything that we do. And I have heard Minister Farrakhan say, you judge a society by the way in which they treat their women, their children, and those that cannot defend themselves. That's how you judge a society. Because an, a knowledgeable woman will raise a knowledgeable society. But if you inferiorize your woman, you are inferiorizing your society. Come on. And you cannot wonder why it doesn't do what it's supposed to do because you did it yourself. There is, a, there is a complete balance in the African thought between the man and the woman. There are unique things that men do by nature of being a man. There are unique things that women do because of the nature, but together they build pyramids. Come on. They build civilizations and societies together. And we knew that. And we built societies around that. And we honored that. And it's time now that we revert back and go back, just like Shabaka went back to his ancestors, feeling what they did was worthy. We have to do the same thing now with Shabaka. We honor Shabaka for honoring his ancestors. Because when we honor Shabaka for honoring his ancestors, we honor his ancestors too. And we ask them to be with us and to be our best friend and to support us and to understand we're talking about scientific principles. Teach. In metaphor. Teach. Metaphor, but scientific principles. Because the third philosophy that is gonna be built from the second philosophy that was built from the first philosophy is called the essences of order and arrangement. And it is said that Atum Kepra calls in to being four pairs. However, I wanna go back to the second philosophy. The depiction of the males, Nun, Ha, Kak, and Amen, they're all frogs. They're, they're all depicted as frogs in the water. When you look at the cover of my book, Spirituality Before Religions, that's the Shabaka stone. Nun, Ha, Kak, and Amen, they are frogs. 
their mates, Nunet, Hahet, Kaket, and Amunet, are snakes. So in the waters of Nun, in the second philosophy, you have four frogs and four snakes. Frog snake, frog snake, frog snake, frog snake. Nun, Nunet, Ha, Ha, Het, Ka, Ka, Ket, Amen, Amenet. But why frogs and snakes? Why of all of the animals, of all the depictions that our ancestors could have chose, why did they choose frogs and snakes? Well, you're teaching us tonight. Come on. I, is it real? Loving I'm this king. To make it Loving real. this king. Okay. What are frogs? What do frogs represent in nature? Teach. Well, I don't know if you do it in UK and other parts where you may watch it, but here in the United States, in sophomore year high school, about 14, 15 years of age in biology class, what is it that you dissect in biology class? You frogs. dissect a frog. Why? Yes. Because a frog has almost the exact same type of central nervous system as a human being. Wow. Wow. A frog represents in its weeks of life, it starts as an egg, it becomes a polywog. And what does a polywog look like? It looks like a sperm cell. And then Each. it becomes a frog. And then the last two weeks of its uh, uh, gestation, it gets rid of its tail. The frog represents metamorphosis. Wow, brother. The frog represents the cycle of life from the egg, which in humans is called the blastula, right until it comes from mother as the mammal and comes forward. Okay? When you look at the life cycle of a frog, so the males represented in life, in the cosmos, the metamorphosis of life. From its very beginnings, before the beginning began, to its finished life, which is the frog that comes forward. That's ha, kuk, nun, and amen, amen. But now we got four snakes that are females. What do snakes represent? Well, snakes do something called molting. And molting is when snakes realize that their skin, they shed their skin. And what snakes do when they shed their skin is that they, they, they segregate themselves privately. There's a film come over their eyes and they go off to the uh, aside and they, they just exist there, almost like in death. And the old skin gets crusty and inside a new skin starts to grow. When the old skin gets to a point where they know that it's time, the snake will go to an area that's very rocky, very rough. And what they'll do is that they'll slide, slither along this rock that will open up that old skin. And what a snake will do is that it'll keep going forward, leaving the old skin behind. The eyes will open up, they'll be able to see again. And as they leave the old skin behind, they go to the new skin in the new life. And so the snake represents resurrection. So here in the second philosophy, you have another concept. And the concept is the cycle of life and the resurrection of that life once the cycle is complete. It is the, it is the forever going on of life. And this is what was in the second philosophy. That's what those eight entities represent. But tell me this, they are called the Neteru Nun, these eight creations of the second philosophy. So you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> Neteru Nun means the uncreated creations, uncreated creations. 
Now, how could they depict uncreated creations? They carved them in Meduneta, and these are the only essences that do not have belly buttons. They don't have navels because they didn't come from a woman. They did not come from a mother, so they were always there. See the metaphor? If you don't have a navel, it means you did not have an umbilical cord, which means that you were not attached to a placenta of a mother, which means that you always existed. Nobody brought you into existence, but you were named by our tomb. That's how deep this is scientifically. Metamorphosis and resurrection in the waters of Nun as frogs and snakes, representing the eight characteristics of the universe, matter, energy, the endless, the finite, that which is in darkness, that which is in light, that which is hidden, and that is which is revealed, which brings forward the next philosophy. These are the neter, or the neteru, that's the plural. Neter is single, N-E-T-E-R, Neteru, N-E-T-E-R-U, U acts as S in, in, when we speak about something, we say snakes. We add an S to make it plural. In Medu Neter, you add a U and it makes it plural. I say to you, uh, Dua. Dua means thank you. Duau means many thanks. Thank you very much. So now we're at the third philosophy, the essences of order and arrangement. The essences of order and arrangement says that Atum Kepra calls into being Shu and Tefnut. Shu represents air. Yeah. Tefnut represents moisture. Now, these are created creations now. These are not like philosophy too. Shu and Tefnut give birth to Nut and to Geb. Okay, Shu, let's go back to Shu. Shu is male and represents air. Tefnut is female and she represents moisture. See, this is where you're getting into the science of the creation of the atoms and the elements, and the molecules. Air and moisture give birth to Nut and Geb. Nut represents the sky and Geb represents the earth. Now that's interesting because Geb is a male and Geb is the earth, but wait a minute. We normally refer to our earth as mother earth. But to, but to the Kushites, it was mother sky and father earth because life don't come from the earth. Life comes from the light, heat, and sound energy of the sun that is allowed to come down to earth through the sky. The story continues. Okay, so there's your four pairs. Shu, Tefnut, Nut, and Geb. Shu, air. Shu air, tefnut moisture, geb is earth, nut is sky. Okay. You can understand it, you can see it. But now, nut and geb are in a lover's embrace. In other words, they are copulating, they are reproducing. This is science, King. It, it is science because during the Carboniferous Age, the sky hovered over the earth. That's a, that's a marriage, that's a love. Exactly, and did not allow the light and heat energy of the sun to penetrate in order to get to the earth. So what did the story say? It said that Shu or air came down and separated Nut from Geb. And that's what allowed the light and heat energy to come down to the earth and create life. And the story continues because then Geb and Nut 
sky and earth give birth to Asar, Aset, Seton, and Nebetet. Now, the Greek names for them is Osiris and Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Which means that Geb, and also keep in mind that Asar is seen as both green and you can see him as black. When you see him green, he represents botanical life. When you see him as black, he represents animal and human life. You can see a saw with plants growing out of his body and he's painted green. That's telling the story of organic life. You'll also see him black and that represents human life. Now, the final piece to it is that Asar and Aset give birth to Heru or Horus, representing resurrection. Now, with all this that we said, we've gone full circle. Because Asar, Aset, Nebetet, Seton, and Heru is the Asarian drama which was the first thing we talked about when we came on and brother investigator, brother Muhammad was showing you Hollywood. And I opened up by saying that Hollywood stole our legacy because the Asarian drama was the first drama that was ever told. And so now here we are, this is Asar. This is Asar. And it is the risen form of Asar, Heru, because Asar and Heru are the same person. They are, Heru is the resurrected father, resurrected mother. And so what you're looking at here is the concept that this is the resurrection of the life. That's why he's got the ankh in his left hand. The left hand receives the right hand gives. Come on, you know, when I'm I... dealing with money no. and I go to the store and I get something, the first thing I do is I always turn, well, in the United States, that's the way our bills are. Every bill on the front, what they call the front, has a dead European president on it. But when you go to the back of the United States currency, every one of them has an Egyptian monument on it. So I don't handle my money with the dead prez on front. I always handle my money on the other side that has the comedic pyramid or the temple. If you look at US currency on the back of every dollar bill, no matter what the, no matter what the denomination, it's all African art. And can, can, can I, can and I so just- And so I always handle my money that way, I don't handle it giving people money with the president looking up. I give it to them with the <laughs> Egyptian Kushite. I, 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 brother, and, can, I, I, can, I just, can I just add that um, from the African um, 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 perception and mythology around Heru, um, and the brother's linking it to Hollywood, remember that from the African word Heru, we get the English word hero. Yes. So in every film, every movie that comes out of Hollywood or anything story, you always have a hero concept. Yes. See? So what the Bible's teaching us, not just even science and chemistry now, he's teaching us the science of filmmaking, of Hollywood, that the first drama is exactly what you're seeing here and nothing's changed. Sorry, my king. No, 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 please, brother. This is us. This is us. This is, this is what I like. I, I, I like this interaction with, with what it is that we're doing because this is what moves us forward. You know, uh, and I learned this through children. Children like to interact. They they don't want to be lectured to. Sir, you know, I have, I have from, please. Oh, sorry, I was going to say I have some questions. I've been trying to kind of group them all. So, and you have been answering a, a few, but I've got a few sort of odd odd ones that if I could just throw a few a few at you, and hopefully there'll be sort of a shortish answer, and I won't take you too far off track. Um, First question is, um, 
Are there any groups of people living by this philosophy today as a people? Philosophy. Everybody's living by it, they just don't realize it. When you got up this morning, you were coming up out of the noon. <laughs> hey! And what Woo! woke you up was the car. Woo! And when you came to realize, remember now, go back to when you woke up this morning. Okay, you were asleep. You were in the waters of noon then. Before the beginning began, because the moment you woke up, your day began. What got you up was pata, converted energy, potential energy at rest, which you were when you were asleep, into energy in motion, which woke you up. And then somewhere when you woke up, you came to realize, yeah, my name is Jarita Bennett. Yeah, my name is Andrew Muhammad. Yeah, my name is Kaaba Kamene. That was Atum. You called yourself into being. Jeez. And then you began to think about what you were going to do. I'm talking about the first moments of you waking up. Then you began to think about what you have to do today or the things that you did yesterday. That is the eight essences of the second philosophy. And then you got up out your bed, you brushed your teeth, you washed your face, you got ready to do whatever it was you were going to do. And that was the essences of order and arrangement and you got your day done. Every day we live the same way the universe came into being is the same thing we do every day when we wake up. And that is why Nut is depicted after she is separated from Geb, she is seen as swallowing the sun and then giving birth to it. She, she's sitting over the earth, bent over. And you can see the sun, she swallows the sun and it goes through her body, which is the night time. And then she gives birth to it, the sun, which is us, uh, or for most of us anyway, because I, <laughs> because I operate at night. <laughs> you really do, brother. You really do. <laughs> yeah, I operate at night. I, I move through the day, but I'm a night eye. But the idea to answer your question is life is the cosmos and the cosmos is life. We are a microcosm and the universe is a macrocosm. And this story that I just told you, the Shabaka stone is what we do every, hey, there's a picture of it there, okay? There's Geb laying down and there is Nut that is extended over and that is Kanum, creation that's holding her up from her mouth to her reproductive areas where the sun is going to be born again. He's holding it up. He separated Nut from Geb. The, the stars are the night stars. And this is a metaphor. Our ancestors were geniuses. And if you knew this story, not only could you control your daydreams, but you could also anticipate your night dreams. Because there are some cultures that believe that you're awake when you sleep and you go to sleep when you wake up. And the way this civilization operates, I think Western civilization is sleep. And so to answer your question and to answer the question itself, we reenact this story every day. But once you master it and you know it, you then become the captain of your ship. You become the director of your life. And it gets back to the story of the log and the swimmer. You have a log in the water and the waves come and go, come and go and the waves push the log and then the other wave come and push the log. The log goes wherever it's pushed. Thank the you. swimmer knows how to use his or her body to be able to go under the wave, through the wave, around the wave. So you control where you're going. The wave don't control you. Yes. So I asked my family, are you a log or, or are you a swimmer? swimmer? 
controlling your destiny. Brother, this, brother, you have fed us today. This is just glorious. And remember, brothers and sisters, we've only got 10 minutes left now. I've gone over time, especially for this. We've got 10 minutes left. And remember this, brothers and sisters, that if you enjoy this truth, then you give thanks to the creator because it is the creator that makes truth appealing in your heart. Some people could hear this and will not connect. But if you're feeling this, it means that the creator's got some love in your heart for truth. Sister Eleanor, I know you're gonna come back, Jurita. Sister Eleanor, how you doing, my queen? You're on mute, you're on mute, sis. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, can, can you unmute yourself, sis? You need to unmute yourself. Let me just see if I can um, unmute the sister. Ask to unmute. Oh, oh sorry. Yes. Yes, my uh, queen. <laughs> Let me ask. Uh, you do, hello. Sister? Thank you for inviting me onto the plan onto the panel. It's um, quite um how to say I'm quite, I'm most honored. Um, oh. thank you so oh, much. I I absolutely this is absolutely the best um lecture I've ever been to. I go to university and uh, yes, this, this is for me, this is tops. Really? Don't tell that to my lecturers. <laughs> we won't. Is that the <laughs> secret? What would you like to say to Professor Sister? Andrew, well, it's a real honor and a privilege um, to meet you amongst others. And uh, I could listen to you forever. Ever. It really touches my heart, my soul, my mind. I mean, you know, and uh, on every level, I feel connected. And I would like to explore you know it further you're fantastic Thank i'm you. going to buy your book as well uh, it's it is come in yeah well my sister uh my name is kaba hiawatha kamene it's on amazon yes and How can it, I? it is titled spirituality before religions i got that okay you're speaking my language you're speaking now, my language my next book that i'm just formatting right i finished it last night mm -hmm. And I finished it last night specifically so that I could speak to my UK family and those who are tuned to let you know that my next book is going to take a part of spirituality before religions, which is the Shabaka stone. And it's going to focus specifically on Shabaka stone. But for now, the book that is, is, a, is a, I've got two books available. One book is titled The Intellectual Libation for the architect of the African Studies Program by William Leo Hansberry. We're into black history. We're into studying African history, but it was William Leo Hansberry in the United States that started here in the United States, the first African Studies Program in 1922 at Howard University, a historically black college. Because up until then, family, we only studied our history through American history, and we only studied slavery or the enslavement process. And it really didn't make us look that good. What William Leo Hansberry did is that he created three subject areas that dealt specifically with Africa, and that revolutionized the study of history. And so I dedicated my first book to him, and then Spirituality Before Religions was my second book, which was an analysis of African writings that shows evidence that every religion and its scripture came from Africa. It's not a motion. Yeah. I don't mention any religions. I'm not trying to insult anybody. No. That's not my purpose. I don't deal that way. What I wanted our people to understand was, if you celebrate Christianity, Africanize it. If you celebrate Islam, Africanize it. You celebrate any religion, I don't care what your religion, Rosicrucian, Zoroastri, Buddhism, I can show you where it came from on the walls of Egypt written by Africans. I can show you papyri. The whole idea of resurrection came out of Africa just 
in the Shabaka stone alone, not even mentioning other sources like the pyramid text or the coffin text. The book of the coming forth today by night is the story of the resurrection. In fact, carved on the walls of the pyramid text, and I go to this in my book, carved on the walls of the pyramid text, it is utterance 276 and 277. They call them utterances. They didn't call them scripture because utterance came from the word of God, not the written word of God, but the vocalization, the atum of God where they talk about the divine human, the Pharaoh Unas, who is moving from one level to, he has died and now he is moving into heaven. And what he does, there's, a, the, the, there's writing where he is eating the body and drinking the blood of the gods. This is where the Eucharistic feast comes from in the Catholic church. But the thing is, is that it wasn't meant to be taken literally. They, they didn't really mean that he actually ate the bodies and drank the blood. What it was, it was a metaphor. The metaphor was, you are what you eat. If you dine of the divinity, you become divine. It wasn't meant to make you think that you were going to eat the body of Jesus Christ and drink his blood. I was an altar boy in the Roman Catholic Church. I served mass. I spoke Latin better than the priest spoke Latin. I was a choir boy. I was an altar boy. I spoke Latin. I went through all that. So I know what's happening in the mass. And in my book, I actually have studied the liturgy of the Roman Catholic mass, and I can sidestep the writings of the pyramid text into the actual celebration of the liturgy of the mass. In fact, you know the altar? The yes. altar in the church, the altar really is a sarcophagus. That's right. That's what an altar is. That's why all the gifts are up on the altar. And when you are performing the mass, the liturgy, what you're actually doing is that you are transforming the coffin of Asar into the cradle of Heru. That's the magic that is being performed in the African mass. It is the, it is the resurrection of the soul. And not just that, but also in life, it's not just death. How many times do we live through something that we have to rise up out of it? When we're going through the depths of enslavement and we rise up into our own personal freedom, that's like the mass. That is like you are, you are allowing your past life to die in order for your new life to exist. It's like the, the snake molting its skin. You are moving from one level to another level. You are rising up through your consciousness, even with your thoughts in your learning, in your schooling. It's the same exact thing. Same example. You are rising up out of the ignorance into the light of intelligence. Beautiful. This is what the Shabaka stone is telling us. This is what our ancestors are telling us. And what they're telling us is that right now, we are in a mass right now. And the mass is that we are resurrecting ourselves up out of the tomb of enslavement into the life of freedom. Teach my king. Be you in UK or in the United States. Wherever. Wherever, wherever an African is, Africa is. And wherever Africa is, I am home. Fantastic. We are one people. Million. We are one people. Thousand square miles. Fantastic. The only difference between us is a boat stop. Fantastic. Brother Kabar, we bow to you, brother. We really, I mean, this has been food tonight. Food tonight. Um, five minutes. Um, Corrine Lawrence, or there's an RS. If you would like to um, ask your question or to state what you would like to, to state to our brother, I'll give you um, a few seconds. If you would like to ask your question or state your point, we've literally got five minutes left. 
Um, Corrine Lawrence or RS, you had your hand up. If not, I'll move on to Sister Corrine, Corrine, Sister Jurita um, to ask a last question. So choose a good, juicy one that our brother, Professor Kabar. Professor Kabar, I, I can't emphasize, brother. This is been food tonight. Sister Jurita, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's 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 about eighteen. I know, but I know, sister. And I, I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to make sure that everyone blames you when their question has not been asked. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I know, Queen. Um, you, you're, you're the best one, sister. You you you're the one that puts it all into order. So, sister, choose one of those. And brothers and sisters, we apologize if your question's not answered tonight. Um, I I, I will ask. Um, our brother, um, Professor Kabar, if you if you do have time, brother, if you can look in the Q and A panel, um, you can actually answer some questions um, by by um, typing the answers directly to them. So hopefully, um, if Professor Kabar has the time, because we've taken up too much of his time tonight, to be honest with you, um, Juri, um, Sister Jurita, can you ask your last verbal question, and hopefully Kabar can answer answer some of your questions. Um, directly after the show finishes. Yes, sister. Yeah, um, my questions are again to do with uh, lots of questions about the Shabaka stone. So I'm going to combine about five or six of them, I think, for this last one and be cheeky. Um, who made the Shabaka stone? Why is there a star in the middle of it? Um, and how does the frequency of the Shabaka stone um, link with Stonehenge? Um, and our journey and our system through Earth. Boy, that was you know, a cheeky I'm, question, sister. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I, you know, I can go back because there was an earlier question that yes. had asked, "How did the British? How did it? How did it get into the British Museum?" Yeah. And it also is going to answer some of your questions, my sister Judita, in terms of um, why there's a that square in the middle of it. This is how we know that the people in of Egypt today are not the original. I'm not. I'm not. Because they would have known what they were dealing with. Okay. Yes. Um, the French, when the French went into Egypt through Alexander Dumas' father, Thomas Dumas, and Napoleon Bonaparte, they uh, came upon, not too far from Cairo, they came upon a group of people that were grinding um uh wheat and they were using a stone as you know a grinding stone many people believe that we don't quite know but the shabaka stone could have been a key that opened up other things and that square in the middle could be but also there are those that believe that square in the middle was what what was part of the way in which they set the stone up to bang on the wheat. That's why you see so many marks on the stone itself. Uh, right behind Brother Muhammad, you can see how the stone, it has been chipped away. So many people believe that. However, the French, when they went in, they noticed the Medunetta. And they said, but wait a minute, what does it say? So what they did is they took this stone from the from the Egyptian people that were using it as a as, as a grinding stone <clears throat> and they gave it to some of the scholars to study which they did. But then by 1800 1801 the British were beaten up on the French. And when the British beat the French they took this stone from them. And then the British soldiers gave it to Earl Spencer of UK. And Spencer of UK donated it to the British Museum in 1805. And so that's how it got into the British Museum. It got there via the French who took it from the Egyptian people who were uh, uh, using it as a, a, a grinding stone. Brother, can I they say- They put it in the French barracks. 
can I just say, brother, just to clarify, when you say the Egyptian people, you mean the Arabs that are in Egypt today? Yes, yes. But you see, I'm afraid of the word Arab because to be an Arab, you got to be black. Yes, I know. Yes, true, true, true. true. I, you know, I call them Afrabs. Yes. Because what makes you an Arab is the fact that you're black. But yes, they would be the people we today call Arabs. The peoples of Egypt that we see today, not the Nubian brothers and sisters down south. But also, if, if I can also say this to you, uh, my brother Andrew and to my sister Jurita and to my brother Leonard and to everyone who is tuning in. It is my honor and my pleasure to be here with you. The time that we spend together is precious to me. And while I may be busy, what keeps me busy is good people like you who invite me onto your platforms to share this information. When I was a young man, I told Dr. Clark, I was in my twenties, I told Professor John Henry Clark, I said, you know, Dr. Clark, I could never repay you for what you've done for me. And Dr. Clark said, you are right, cause you ain't got that much money. <laughs> but he said, you can pay me back by doing for others what I have done for you. And so this fellowship that we have had today, I thank you for because it gives me a chance to thank my teacher, Professor Clark. When you allow me to do this, you give me the opportunity to thank Professor Clark because I always promised him that I would. And so when I taught our babies, our children, when I worked in the Board of Education, when I visit places and I share this information, this is all my repaying all those that did so much for me. And so I thank you for this opportunity uh, to be across the waters with my family in UK and, and in Africa and in all of the other places where you are touching. This is our time now, family. This is our time. This was the time that was set aside. This is the time that our ancestors who were enslaved saw. When they prayed for a better day, we are their better day. We are who they created. And when they call that, when they call for that, when they call for the better day, they literally were calling us into existence. We are their greatest thoughts. Let me just say something else and then let me just say this so that we all can understand. When you think about our ancestors, when we think about our, I'm talking science now, we have a mother and a father and we have uh, two sets of grandparents and we have eight sets of great grandparents and you can go on the line. If I were to go back 20 generations, if you go back 20 generations, we're talking about who our ancestors are. If you go back 20 generations, which if you consider a generation to be 20 years, you're talking about 400 years, 20 times 20. You're basically dealing with 400 years. So if we go back to 1621, just think about that, 1621, 400 years ago, 2021. When you think of your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your second set of great grandparents, if you go back 20 generations, your ancestors that dwell in you, each and every one of you, if you go back, you possess 1,047,000. 576 human beings in you. That's how many human beings it took to bring you into existence in this day if you go back 400 years. We're talking, wait a minute now, 4 million, 576 human beings dwell in me? And I only went back 400 years? What happens when I go back to the Tua and Booty? Hundreds of thousands of years ago. 
How many ancestors do each and every one of us have? You think you walk alone? You don't walk alone. You're walking with billions of ancestors. So, sir, that leaves me then to cut you again, then. I'm You're sorry. not cutting me, my sister. You're just adding to the conversation. <laughs> and this this will be my last one, I promise. Um, it's only, again, you can ask as many questions you want, my sister. Go on, I'm my gonna queen. Be, I'm going to be cheeky with this one again and sort of say, the first is uh, we need some contact details from you. I've got lots yes. of questions, so I'm going to ask if you could give me some contact details before you finish. So I can sure. share those with some people. People are asking if you do things online that they can tap into or um, online seminars, et cetera. So if you could give me those contact details. But my final question is, if you're saying we have all of these millions of ancestors that are um, you know, within us and all of us tend to at some point um, pray or try and tap into that system for guidance, for support, um, for an innate network, if you like, how would you suggest we do that? What's the tips in order to, to use that network? What, you know, how do we make use of it? You are your ancestors. Just talk to yourself. It's simple, family. You know, we have been constructed, they have constructed for us a very elaborate way of praying. They have created a very elaborate way of doing things to honor. And I think of my children. Just them wanting to talk to me makes me feel good. They don't have to say anything special. Hey, dad, how you doing? You know, I was thinking about you. I wanted to call. I wanted to talk to you. That's how I think about the creator and the ancestors. All, the, all they want to do is hear from us. All they want is recognition that they exist and that we realize that they exist. I never pray for anything because I know that the will has already been done. All I ask for is guidance to take me through the process so that I Woo! know when it happens. Woo! Hallelujah. It's very simple, family. Don't have to make it complicated. Just talk. Because first of all, you don't have to ask for anything because they already know what you want. They already know what the plan is. The only thing that they could do is po possibly intercede in order to give you like a 411 before it actually go down. <laughs> like, be careful. Don't take that bus today. <laughs> Walk to work. <laughs> Make it simple. Make it plain. They don't want nothing elaborate. They just want you to, and even the ones that you'll never know. You talk about 1 million. 47,576. Uh, okay, there are going to be some ancestors I don't know ever existed. I know my parents. I know my grandparents. When I get into my great-grandparents, great I heard about them. When you get into your great-great-grandparents, oh, I heard about them. But there's certain generations I have no idea, but I know they existed because I'm here. Talk to them. Tell them I may not know your name, but you dwell within me. So I know you're there. You're what made me who I am. This is science. This isn't no, you have parents, grandparents, great grandparents. You know that by nature. No one has to have to prove to you that you have parents. The fact that you're here means you have parents. Our ancestors only want to be recognized. They, they want to be with us. They are our eyes that cannot see, our ears that cannot hear, our voice that cannot speak, our skin that cannot touch, our nose that cannot smell. They have access and will allow you to smell the unsmellable, see the unseeable. And at the same time, we are their eyes to see, their ears to hear, their skin to touch, our nose to smell, our tongue to taste. So symbiotically working together, they provide us with things that we don't see and we provide them with things that they can see. And together we can come to the conclusions that we need to come to, but make it simple. Make, make it plain. It, keep it simple. 
Keep it simple. No, don't 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 keep, try to make it because then you get overwhelmed and then you start to get superstitious. You start thinking, well, if I don't pray this way, it's not going to work. Or if I don't do this, it's not going. No, it's going to work. It's going to work if your heart is right. If your heart is right, it'll work. I, I stand as testament to that. Spirituality is unseen science. Science Woo! is seen spirituality. Brother, say that one more time, please. Just say that sentence. Link shot pon Babylon one more time. Spirituality is unseen science and science is seen spirituality. That's the subtitle of the book, Spirituality Before Religions. Brothers and sisters, are you listening? You know that God loves you. How do we know that God loves you? Because you're here tonight in this house, listening to this. Professor Kabar. And, and, and my brother, can I just say something else? Yes. There's another way you know God loves you. Come on when you love yourself Woo! because you are the creator having a human experience Woo! and when you love yourself you love the creator Hallelujah. and when you love the creator you love the creator's creation so much that you would treat them the way in which you treat the i creator. see you i you see you you see now let me answer the sister's question and then i know we're going to wrap this up please go to my website www kabakamane.com k a b a k a m e n e.com you can download my free e course on my book spirituality before religions and my study guide 44 pages that is an outline of my life's work it's the most important document i have that's why it's free come on Come on. It's free. And it's free for you to see where I'm going. Because Dr. Clark told me, he said, let me tell you something, Booker T. He said, not all of us are going to reach our destination. But if you leave the right roadmap, those that come behind you will get there. And so this, and I don't plan on going anyplace anytime soon. So I'm not like saying anything. What I'm saying <laughs> is that. I have a dream. Dr. King got a dream, I got a dream. My dream is a school where I see children excited about learning. I see them raising their hand, asking questions, just like my sister Jurita. I see them engaged in a classroom and growing. I see them interacting with each other. I see the teacher smiling. I see the children smiling. I see them growing and becoming productive citizens of the planet. I see them studying solar power, mathematical equations. That's my dream. I don't know if I'm ever going to see that in my lifetime. I you hope will. I do. You will. But I don't know if I, but there's one thing I know. And I know this is sure as my dream will be fulfilled. I know that if I just keep on doing what I'm doing, I know if I keep talking to the investigator and to Sister Jurita and Sister Leonard, if I keep coming back to UK and to the family and keep talking to them, I know one day my dream will come true. I may not be here, but like my ancestors on the plantation who were enslaved and raped and through mayhem and mischief, through blood, sweat, and tears, with everything that they went through, they knew something. They knew if they just kept going, somebody would be free. They knew that they may never have seen that freedom in their lifetime, but they knew that if they just woke up tomorrow, listen, and kept doing what they were doing, listen. somebody would be free. We Listen. are that dream that they had. We are that dream that they had. And now I am dreaming for that school. And wherever you are in your station of life, whatever you do, I'm education. Whatever you do, if, if you are into economy, what is your dream? If you're into politics, what is your dream? 
if you're into any form of self-defense, what is your dream? Brother, 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 brother. I'm going to be very cheeky. Look, be honest with you, brother. We've gone way over time. But listen, what I'm going to say. Listen, what I'm going to say, brother, professor. We've still got 400 people on the platform eagerly listening to you, okay, brother? I'm going to be so feisty to ask you two minutes of more of your time. Just two minutes, brother. I give you all a, you need. A, a, a beautiful sister. I don't know the sister personally. I think it may be her first time on this platform, but... Some time ago, as you were teaching, she asked a question and I noted the question. And I said, you know what, tonight I am going to ask it to you, sis, brother. And if you can answer it within that two minutes, I bow to you. But she said this, brother. She loves the teaching that you're giving. Yeah. She said, what's the point of knowing all of this knowledge and knowing, the, knowing your enemy? Because we had people like Malcolm X that had this knowledge and knew the enemy and they still killed him. What would you say to the sister that asked that question? Because I think it was a very sincere question and it's a beautiful question. And I'd love to know what would be your answer to that queen on the platform today? What's the point of knowing all of this if they're still going to kill you? You know, there's a movie out, just came out. It's called Judas and the Messiah. The, the Asarian drama, the Shabaka Stone tells us that all of us are born with a Judas and a Messiah. Internally, Judas is Satan and the Messiah is Heru, the resurrected Asar. Each of us is born with that. And the bottom line is Judas dwells within you to make sure you don't achieve your goals. The Messiah is in you to make sure Judas is not successful. The concept is you only have one enemy and that enemy is the Judas that dwells within. Everything else Everything else on the outside is an obstacle. Oh, you're not playing tonight, King. You're not playing. No, we're not playing. Because we don't have time to play now. We have to do this for our children. I have a 100-year plan. I don't have a 20-year plan. I don't have a 10-year plan. I have a 100-year. I have a plan on how I see the earth 100 years from now. We have to begin to realize and look at this for what it really is. The European is not as great as you think they are. They have created an illusion of greatness. They have constantly given you the concept that you, you are inferior. And the whole while they have created a civilization that could not be no more inferior than the civilization created by the Roman empire that fell. It is as inferior as the Greek empire, which fell. And yet we sit on a thousand upon thousands of year legacy of African greatness. And they have only been in, in existence no more than 5,000 years and they're still falling and toppling out of control. We haven't studied our history and when you study history, people say, well, what's the purpose of history? Well, well, history is like a slingshot. And the idea of when you pull back the slingshot, the idea is not how far you pull it back. The idea is how far you want to propel the object into the future. So if I could take this slingshot metaphor and put your mind inside the sling and pull it back into the past. I'm not pulling it back for you just to stay in the past. I'm pulling it back because I know the further back I go, the further in the future, I'm gonna propel your mind. And so what we have to begin to do is to realize that Malcolm did what Malcolm did so we could do what we have to do. Smelly, smelly. 
Booker T. Washington did what he did in order for Booker T. Coleman, Kaba Hiawatha, to do what he's doing. Sig Step and fetch it did what he did so that Kevin Hart could do what he did. Stink. Everything we do is on the shoulders of our ancestors. So have no fear for atomic energy because none, none of them can them stop, can stop time. the time. You it's just over. keep doing what you're doing. It don't make a difference. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand, we stand aside, aside and, look. and look? Some say it's just a just part, a part of, of it. Got we to gotta fulfill, fulfill. the book. <laughs> you see it? Kabar. Just keep oh. on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Come I've got on. A, a online class, the Comedic Wisdom School. You can go to uh, Rev Shock. You can go to Philippe, brother uh, investigator. You can give them the information. Don't worry, brother. I was, about, I was about to say, brother, all of you that are on my mail out list, all of this, the link will go in the next my next email. So all of you on the platform right now will get the link directly to all of this. Brothers wow. and sisters, brothers and sisters, day. what a night. What a night. Oh, brother Professor Kabar. I can see yourself and Lady Adele dropping this school. That's the vision. We need it. We want it. Brother, may the creator eternally bless you, brother, just for tonight alone. We know you've done a billion times plus than this, but just for tonight alone, brothers and sisters in the audience, wherever you may be, in the UK, the Caribbean, in, a, in, in, in stateside with the brother, whether you're literally in China, we get people who look, please, 400 of you, please show some smelly love, some smellified love to this king tonight. Did you hear the man's, I'm only talking about hear the man's voice. Did you hear his soul speak to us? Yeah, it ain't about the knowledge. I've seen people that are knowledgeable, but when you meet them, they, they don't smell good. This brother has got a fragrance that smells good because it's coming from the most high. Jurita, what did you want to say? No questions there. Time is up tonight. Our brothers killed the game. Yes, Jurita. No, no question. I just wanted to say I, I felt it for sure. Tell, tell him, tell him, tell him. It was a really awesome night. I bow. Thank you so much. Um, and and, and brother, um, brother Kabar Jurita is senior leadership team in one of our schools in the UK. So she's at oh, the top wow. of the um, network. So you're talking about two educational minds touching base tonight. Absolutely fantastic. Bravo, Professor oh, Kabar. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. The, the, the road is not over. The journey has only begun. It's our job. It's our job to make sure that we don't pass on a baton and take our children backwards. We take them forward, brothers and sisters. So whatever we're doing today is to serve that next generation. Professor Kabar, I don't know what to say to you, brother. We bow to you. We thank you. And brother, I'm going to say this, brother. In 30 seconds, what's your last marching orders for us on this platform? Teach the children the truth so they can fix things. Okay. Keep on keeping on. It ain't over until we win. I am, I am a little... I do not think in terms of me having a hard day. I just invoked the spirit of our ancestors that went through far more than I. And I just asked them every day, please give me the spirit that you have so that we can do what we have to do. Well, and I well, honestly well. believe that this ain't over until we win. We were destined to make this happen. And all we got to do is keep doing what we're doing. Sister Judita, as one teacher to another, I send my regards to you. I recommend that you do get my um, my um, my study guide because it'll give you a sense of my direction in my life and what I'd like to do. It's my direction as to where I'm going. It's 44 pages. It is the most valuable document to all of the teachers and to all of us adults because we're all teachers. Mm -hmm. How it feels when you first wake up to the truth. You just got to get them cobwebs out your eyes. That's the key, <laughs> brother. Brother, that's what you've done to us tonight, brother. You took us on such a universal pathway. It's just been brilliant. And I just had a picture sent to me from another sister, um, Sister Trody. I see you on the platform, Sister Trody. 
She said she bought your book some time ago. She just decided just to open up at any page. What page did she open it up on? The Shabaka Stone. Yep. So Sister Chodi sent me sent me this picture while she was teaching, um, brother, wow. and I had to share it with us because see there are no accidents in the universe, brothers and sisters. There is no accidents. You are here because you are called to be here. You are here because of cause and effect. Tonight has been divine revelation on all levels, brothers and sisters. And please, to, um, tonight I want to I want to dedicate this tonight show to our beautiful queen. A few weeks ago, I mentioned that. This beautiful sister traveled with myself and a team of us to ancient Kemet, to Kemet when we used to do the Kemet tours. She is a beautiful mother, grandmother, great grandmother, whatever, and she was laid to rest today. And it's no coincidence that Professor Kabar spoke about the feminine aspect of creation. And he gave us a long breakdown about the African concept and respect that we pay to all of our mothers and our sisters our daughters across the line. So, uh, uh, brother Professor Kabar, I thank you for that because this is the sh this is the queen I wanted to dedicate our our, our our show to tonight. It was laid to rest due to transition, and her beautiful daughter Edwina, brother Harold, and the whole family. So, we want to honour this sister. Don't forget, my brothers and sisters. Next week, we're going UK. Next week, brothers and sisters. We've got the great man himself, Robin Walker, the Black History mm. Man, the award-winning man, Robin Walker, and our king, our king, Leo Marshall from Hidden Science. I've got two bad men, because I, 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 I had to double up, because maybe we've got Professor Kabar one week. We've got to double up next week, Bridget, because we've got to keep it strong, man. This brother's not playing, not playing, not playing, not playing, brothers and sisters. So... Before we finish tonight, before we finish tonight, brothers and sisters, once again, you show your loves. A sister asked a question. Why do you put ones in the chat room? We put the ones down because you are number one. We put the ones down because the one represents unique, unit. We put the ones down because it's the God that's inside of you and me. So when you see a lot of people putting down the ones, it means that we're literally got a God spirit atmosphere amongst us. And when we say something is smelly, it means that we can smell the God in that person. We can smell the fragrance. We can smell the success. And I will say to you, brother, Professor Kabar, you smell tonight. You stinked up the show tonight, brother. And you put your hands up because we want God to create. We want the most high to bless you for tonight. You opened up the airwaves. 